Well, good evening. Thanks for coming back. <laughs> it's always a bad feeling when you speak in the morning and nobody shows up at night. You know you were just terrible, you know? So, anyhow, it's such a privilege to speak to all of you. And so many of you took home the 50 Things book and the Biblical Worldview book today. And, and, and look at me. Don't just take it home. Go home and go through it like crazy. And if you've got grandkids that are not here... Uh, if you got anybody in your family getting ready to have a baby, that is the best gift you could ever give them. Um, you know anybody, uh, one school in Vancouver purchased uh, 70 copies. They gave one to the parents of every single kindergartner in their school. A church, a guy on Twitter, I don't even know this man, but he pastors in Midlothian, Virginia. He sent me an inbox the other day and said, I'm buying 200 books. I want, I want one in the hands of every family in my church that has kids. And uh, so... Anyhow, take the time to peruse that. The Biblical Worldview book is also a fantastic uh, resource for you. And so it's, it's Biblical Worldview in simple terms, I would call it that, uh, that particular book. So anyhow, it's, it's truly, uh, I appreciate your response today. And, and, and honestly, there's an awakening in America. We've never seen anything like it. Um, you realize that we've picked up, I said a little something about today, but in Christian schools and home schools, we've picked up uh, about probably 3 million children in the last 24 months. 3 million kids have come out of secularized education into Christian schooling or home, Christian homeschooling. Guys, that, that is nothing other than an awakening. It's, it's a movement of God Almighty. And so, you know, we've had so many bad things happen as a result of COVID. But I'm going to tell you something. There have been a lot of great things happen as well. There really have been. It's, it's kind of like God had to shake us up. The other cool thing that's happening in our public school situation is that parents have decided. Did you hear that this past week they recalled two or three of the board members of the San Francisco district schools? They, they recalled them like 75 percent. They voted against them and to boot them out. I mean, this is liberal San Francisco. Now, I'm sure the people, you know, coming into their positions won't be absolutely conservative like we are. But I'll tell you something. On several major issues, they said, no, you're not doing it to our children any longer. And so there's a great awakening. And I praise God for it. And uh, let's catch that wave. I mean, parents are, are ready right now, like never before, uh, to, to learn and how to raise godly children. And uh, we want to make sure that as churches and schools and families, we're right, we're right where God's moving. And that's where he's moving right now. So tonight I'm going to do something a little bit different. Um, uh, I want to talk to you. I want to address uh, the issue of education tonight. Uh, at Renew Nation, you know, we, we have five divisions of ministry, church families, one of them, uh, and then Christian education is another, and we have major, major stuff going on in Christian education. We are receiving 15 calls a month from communities across America to help them launch new Christian schools, 15 at least a month. Sometimes it's six or seven in a week. And thank God, through multiple programs that we have at Renew Nation, we are literally helping, uh, we're helping them launch Christian schools all across America. We also help homeschool families if they call us and they want to homeschool their kids, but they have no clue what to do. We have coaches that help them uh, know how to homeschool their kids. We've got all kinds of programmings, programs in Christian education. And, and, and here's the deal. Um, the reason I, I want to address the issue of education tonight um, is because you cannot discuss worldview without discussing your child's education. You can't do it. Now, if you're here tonight and you teach in public schools or you're an administrator in public schools, I'm not banging on you. And I want you to understand that I have many, many friends who are adult friends who are missionaries in public schools. They're given their best. It's getting harder and harder and harder, they tell me, okay? Uh, some of them you know, actually, there's an exodus out of public education by Christian teachers right now and administrators because the screws have come down so tight on the homosexual issues, on transgenderism, um, and some things like that, that they're just like, hey, that's enough. I'm not going to be a part, part of that. However, there are many others who are fighting, and they're trying to, to keep it from being as bad as it possibly could be. And so if you're one of those tonight, I want you to know that I appreciate that. I really do. I, I thank God for you. Um, I, I'm not one any longer who, who encourages people to make their children missionaries in the public schools. And again, you might get upset at me if you have your children in public schools. Don't do that. Listen to me, okay? 
Um, I've just seen all the statistics over the last 50 years, and I'll show you more of them tonight. And it hasn't worked out very well. Yes, we have cases where it's worked out fine. Um, there's no doubt about that to some degree. Uh, but at the same time, it just hasn't worked out well. But what I don't want to do is alienate you tonight and think that you don't have a role or a place in the church. Obviously, you do. And if, that, if you can't afford Christian education, that's a very tough situation. I understand that. And so we don't want to in any way make you feel bad tonight. But I want to tell you the truth about what's happening in education, why I think it's so critical and so important. So let's just pause and pray. Lord, I pray that in the time we have together tonight, that you would speak to hearts and minds and that you would you would help people to see if what I'm saying is true, Lord, tonight, and that you would help each one of us know what our response should be. I thank you here at Bethel, Lord, that they've had a Christian school for many years. But even in churches that have had Christian schools, um, it's been renewed in the last couple of years. But before that, there was a fatigue uh, with Christian schooling across the country. There was a sense that, man, it's such a big burden. It's such a, a cost to our organization. It's such a challenge. And not all of our kids turn out perfect. And there was such a fatigue across the country. I praise you that you have rejuvenated Christian education in America in the last couple of years. But I pray that those who are in leadership of this church would once again tonight be reminded of the powerful tool that Christian education is to disciple children and raise the next generation of Christ-like leaders. So just help us tonight, I pray. Pray in Christ's name, amen. D.L. Moody said, If I had my life to live over, I would devote my entire ministry to reaching children for Christ. That was the great D.L. Moody towards the end of his ministry. If I had my life to live over, I would devote my entire ministry to reaching children for Christ. That's a pretty powerful statement from a man whom God used to lead adults to Christ the world over. And I think what he was realizing was what all of us are realizing, what I told you this morning, that when you influence a three-year-old or six-year-old, uh, and I appreciate the pastor's correction, but you're directly influencing life on earth from that person and their children, and obviously their grandchildren, for a minimum of the next hundred years, and obviously for all uh, eternity. And I think Moody kind of, it dawned on him. Um, that if we don't reach children, there's no future for the church here in, in, in the world, and uh, there's really no future for our nations. Um, we read in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 4 and 5, For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations, arguments, or arguments, and every high thing or lofty opinion that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. I cannot think of any greater way to define the mission of Christian education than to say it is our mission to help our students learn to destroy every argument and lofty opinion that is raised against the knowledge of God and to bring every thought under the lordship of Jesus Christ. That ought to be the goal of your school. That ought to be the goal of every Christian school, every Christian homeschool, every parent who's discipling their child in the home. We should have a passion to help our young people so that they can uh, cast down arguments and every high or lofty opinion that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and to bring into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. That's our goal in Christian education. We're trying to raise up a generation of warriors. When we give our students a biblical worldview, they are enabled to destroy the arguments and lofty opinions that are raised against the knowledge of God. One man said, imagine if we started raising generations of children who stood uncompromisingly on the word of God, knew how to defend the Christian faith, could answer the skeptical questions of this age, and had a fervor to share the gospel from the authority of God's word with whomever they met. I believe that is the mission of Christian education. See, the purpose of our Christian schools is not to just shelter kids from the world. It's not just to keep them away from the bad kids. It's not just so that they can have a, a, a better academic experience. Some of those things happen, but that's not the purpose. Our purpose is to raise up a new generation of young men and women who can do this right here. All right, that's our purpose. 
I found a quote from Martin Luther, uh, the Martin Luther from the Reformation. And you know, Martin Luther wasn't very politically correct. If you read after Martin Luther, you will be shocked at times. Matter of fact, I found the coolest quote from him. He, he stood up on a Sunday morning and said, today is the day we receive the offerings for the church. And most of you should be utterly ashamed of yourselves. <laughs> <laughs> he went on to scold him. Pastor Chris, if you ever did that here, the whole church would walk out on you. I mean, you should have heard how Martin Luther said that. But anyhow, he was the man God used to bring the Protestant movement and re reinvigorate Christianity in the world. But listen to what he said. See if I can read it. Christendom must have people who can beat down their adversaries and opponents and tear off the devil's equipment and armor that he may be brought into disgrace. Listen to me. My passion, our passion at Renew Nation is to raise up a new generation of young men and women who will bring the devil into disgrace in this world. That's our passion. All right. So we're raising up warriors, folks. We're not raising up people who are just going to be sweet and nice. No, they're going to be sweet and nice, but they're going to know the truth. And they're going to address the devil's lies in this world that we live in today. All right. I like that. But for this work, powerful warriors are needed who are thoroughly familiar with the scriptures and can contradict all false interpretations and take the sword from false teachers. Let me tell you something. I told you the story of TJ this morning. When TJ, in front of that class and his godless professor, when he, defend, when he helped them understand why we shouldn't be aborting children, he literally took the sword of abortion out of the hand of his college professor. He was trained, he was equipped, and he was able to do this. Each Christian should be so armed that he himself is sure of his belief and of the doctrine and is so equipped with the sayings from God's word that he can stand up against the devil and defend himself when men seek to lead him astray. I think all of us can agree tonight that there is a worldview battle raging for the hearts and minds of our children in every part of our culture and especially in the arena of education. If you read at all... If you read it all, if you've been following the battles from school boards and parents across America, you understand that our children in this world are being taught things that are absolutely unthinkable. I could show you some material that our children are being taught that would literally make you want to throw up. It's that bad now. So I think we can all agree that there is a worldview battle raging in our culture. I'd like to highlight the four major influences on the worldview development of children in our culture today. First of all, the home and the family should be the dominant influence in our children's lives. And that's why I talked to you this morning, obviously addressing parents and grandparents today earlier. And um, I want to say it again, that parents, you have the greatest influence over your children for good, for bad. Absolutely, you have the greatest influence. Even if you don't try, you're going to have the greatest influence. Do you understand? Apathy is a great influence on your children. If you're apathetic towards the things of God, if you're apathetic in how you train them, that is a huge influence upon your children. So parents should be the greatest influencers of the worldview development of their children, but far too many parents have abdicated their role when it comes to biblical worldview development, and far too many parents are not intentional in the home. We're not going to re-speak re re-preach this morning stuff, but the bottom line is that's why we wrote the 50 things book because we want to give parents a plan to be intentional. Often I've been speaking for years on this subject and I, everywhere I go, parents come up to me and say, we agree, but what are we supposed to do? How do we do this? And finally at Renew Nation, we're getting the tools to help make that a reality. So moms and dads take full responsibility you're going to have the greatest influence one way or the other, so make sure it's for good and for God. Uh, I would say, though, the average Christian family is not the, 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 the most dominant influence in the lives of many of their children when it comes to biblical worldview development at this point. Second, the church ought to be a major influence in the uh, worldview development of the, of the children and their care. But if a church, the, the problem with churches is we simply don't have these children for enough time to have a massive influence, especially if they have other influences that, where they spend a lot more time. And so the average kid in America today, believe it or not, the average evangelical child in America only attends church on average 1.5 times per month right now. 1.5 times per month. 
Okay? From kindergarten to 12th grade, if a child goes to church once a week, once a week, they'll spend about 700 hours at church from kindergarten to 12th grade. If they go a couple times a week, then you can double that. They'll get the 1,400 hours or maybe as many as 2,000 hours if they go to church a couple times a week. I want you to keep those numbers in your mind, all right? So the church should be the dominant influence, should be a dominant influence on the worldview development of a child. But I, I hate to tell you, but most churches are not. You guys are being super intentional here and you've got, you've got a school that makes changes that dynamic drastically. But most churches in America, we're, we're into what we call attractional entertainment, children and youth ministry. The goal is, and I heard you're going to have a lot of fun here. I'm not picking on you. You better have fun with your kids. Trust me. And I bought more pizza as a senior pastor. I mean, if I'd have had the money from pizza, we could have built a new church, okay? So I'm not against pizza. You better feed kids. If they come, you better make it a good time. But the bottom line is, if that's all you're doing, attractional entertainment, you're wasting God's time and money. Because when they, those kids go to a, a non-Christian school, you think that that's all they're doing? No, they're teaching them in worldview every single day. And far too many churches in America don't really have a scope and sequence. What do we want a kid? Here's what I've been asking pastors. What do you want your kids to know if the only thing they know about God is what they learn at your church? What will they know when they're 18 years old? If you've got them for all 18 years, what will they know? And I've had many pastors look me in the face and say, not much. And so we've got to get serious. The church should be a dominant influence. And, and, and unfortunately, in most kids' lives in America, the church almost has no influence whatsoever. But it doesn't have to be that way, and you guys are doing, you're really working at it, I can tell. Third, this is where we start to see who's influencing our children in America today, pop culture and media. I read that the average child from 6 to 18 years old in the United States will spend between 15 and 20,000 hours watching television, movies, surfing the internet, playing video games, and listening to music. 15 to 20,000 hours from 6 to 18 years old. One of my, my student ministries pastor, when I was still pastoring one time, looked at me and said, Jeff, do you understand that music is the language of young people? And because uh, we were having all these talks about music and everything that was going on, and he told me that. And now with social media, guys, listen. I just read today that, that TikTok, some big person was saying TikTok should be banned from young people. I think the perfect way to describe our generation is the, is the word selfie. Think about it. Look at me. But what we have done is we have created this image consciousness that is utterly ridiculous. And young people cannot live up to all that they see out there. And literally, we have, a, we have a crisis of suicide amongst young people in our world today. A crisis of suicide. Because they don't think they can live up. They see all this fake world that everybody's portraying on social media. So, again, the, the bottom line is, it's a massive influence on our young people. And we have to be very aware of it. Uh, and, and really be, be proactive in how we do that. And how we interact with it or let them interact with it. So anyhow, the home, the family, the church, pop culture media is where we really, it's having a huge influence on young people. But this is the one in some settings where they're surprised that the average child will spend from kindergarten to 12th grade, roughly 16,000 hours at school. 16,000 hours at school. And I still have Christians in this country who tell me it doesn't matter where a child spends those 16,000 hours. I'm here to tell you tonight, I don't care what you do with a child for 16,000 hours from kindergarten to 12th grade, it's going to have a massive influence on their life. I don't care what you do with them. As a matter of fact, you know, a lot of people in the world, especially the left in our culture today, they're way ahead of us as Christians on this issue. You know what they say? They don't want us to have our children for 16,000 hours. They want them because they know they can shape their thinking. All right. So again, I'm not trying to be harsh tonight. I'm trying to be tough, but I'm, tell, I'm dealing in facts. We've watched tens of millions of evangelical children walk away from the faith in the last 50 years, guys. And we have got to stand up and say, wait a minute. What do we have to do to change this scenario? So a worldview battle is raging for the hearts and minds of our children in this culture. 
A major part of our mission at Renewination is to help parents and pastors understand the powerful role that education is playing in influencing children for good or evil. Even though I grew up attending Christian schools for most of my K-12 years, I never saw Christian education as a critical part of my life's mission until two things happened in my life. When I became a young pastor in Hollywood, Florida, inner city church, it was wild and crazy. I never even, I never even thought about a Christian school. And yet, when my daughters were born, I immediately, like you remember that, I started going, okay, wait a minute, I'm living in the jungle down here. What, where am I going to put these girls in school? I mean, this is a wild and crazy place I'm living. I wonder, and I, I was making a small church salary. I didn't have the money to put them in the big, huge Christian school about a mile from my house. I was like, what in the world am I going to do? And that was the first thing that hit me. And the second thing was I became a pastor. And I began to think, and I'll tell you that story in a minute. But when I first held Julianne and then Heidi, I knew beyond a shadow of a doubt that my mission in life had just changed. I knew that I was responsible for their physical and spiritual well-being. And as I kind of told you this morning, I, I just had this great overwhelming sense that, that my mission for them was to help them come to know, love, and serve the Lord Jesus above all other things. And you say, well, didn't you have ambitions for them to become lawyers or doctors or not really? My ambition was to help them know, love and serve Jesus because I knew that if we got them there, they would do whatever Jesus wanted them to do. And that's all I cared about was seeing that they walked with Jesus and followed his plan. Because of this passion in my heart, I knew I had to educate them in a way so, they, so, so that they would know, love, and serve Jesus. And I was determined from a very early age that no person would have influence in their life if they would in any way lead them away from this mission. No person would have influence in their lives if, I would, if, they, would, if they would in any way lead them away from the mission. Michelle and I are so grateful. Let me just tell you this. Because of that passion that burned in our hearts, we made our minds up. We were not going to overly shelter our kids. My daughters went on, I think it was 14 missions trips as teenagers. The first one, Juliana went at 11 years old to New York City, to Times Square, and literally went with a team that we had from our church that put up prayer stations and shared the gospel. And here my 11-year-old, they're sending me pictures back. I wasn't able to go. She's standing out there with this frock on saying, can I pray for you? And she was sharing the gospel. And then Heidi went with her later. And they came back and said, Dad, we were telling people how to get saved on the streets of New York City. That was awesome. Now, we did get a little bit tested because I'll never forget um, Juliana ended up in Honduras in the middle of a monsoon. And this is the God's honest truth. She told me somehow, I forget how we were communicating back then. Maybe it was email. She said, Dad, when we flew into this airport, it was on top of a mountain. And over the side of the mountain, there were all kinds of crashed airplanes. She told me this. But, you know, I'd given her to Jesus. So I was like, go where you want to go, you know. And uh, I'll never forget that she got stuck in that city in a monsoon. And she was emailing us and she said, we, we can't go outside the compound because they said, if we step outside the compound, they'll attack us and rob us. I said, OK, that Jesus, I put her in your hands. And this is the God's honest truth. While she's stuck in Honduras in a monsoon. My wife and I came across a documentary on TV called The World's 20 Most Dangerous Airports. This is the God's honest truth. And so we watched 20, 19, 15, 10, 7, 8, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2. And my kid was trying to fly out of the second most dangerous airport in the entire world. At that moment, I was like, God, I don't know about this thing, about giving it to you. I think you're actually going to take her. I'll never forget when Heidi went to Uganda. And she came back and she looked me in the face and said, Dad, you're not going to believe this. I said, what? She said, Dad, they took me out to this village with just mud huts. And these were Muslims, Dad. And Dad, I literally shared the gospel with many of them. And many of them prayed to be saved, Dad. These were Muslims, Dad. I was like, praise God. I didn't know where she was at, actually. I didn't know they were taking her to that village. I'm glad they didn't tell me in advance. But anyhow, we made up our mind. They were, we were going to give them to the Lord. That was our, our passion. So we didn't want anybody to get in the way of that. We're so glad we made this commitment. I can't go anywhere. Here they are when they were just, uh, that's Juliana on the left there. And first day of school ever. And that's Heidi at her kindergarten graduation day. Here they are on the day they graduated from high school or close to it. We're confident what they learned from their first year of school to the last year made them who they are today. 
We don't, we don't regret one bit that we sent them to a Christian school for 16,000 hours. We're so grateful because our teacher, the teachers there did such a great job. I don't recommend sending them off to college because this is what happens to them. They will bring back ugly people like this and you'll never get rid of them. And then if you don't, if you let them hang around long, let me tell you how that boy got married to my daughter. This is my oldest son-in-law, Andrew. And so when they were juniors in college in a state for, uh, you know, a couple states away from us. And Juliana called me in their junior year. And, and listen, boys will do anything to get to come home for spring break with their girlfriends. You know what I'm saying? You watch them, parents. They'll do anything. And so Juliana calls me and said, Dad, the last time we were there, Andrew noticed that our freestanding car, two-car garage out back needed a brand new roof. He wants to come home during spring break with me and put a roof on the garage. <laughs> This was a four-sided roof. It was kind of complicated. And I thought, yeah, right. Some 20-year-old kid is going to put a roof on my garage. So she said, no, Dad, he knows how to do it. He knows how to do it. He'll do it. So I thought, what better way to test out and see if this is the guy I want to marry my daughter? So that kid came home in two days. He got up on that roof. He tore that roof, all the shingles off. He repaired all the rotten wood, put all new shingles on, did an amazing job, jumped off the roof, went, well, there you go. I looked at him and said, you can marry my daughter. That's the second time I said that to him. You can marry my daughter right now. That's exactly what I was hoping for in a son-in-law. Somebody could fix broken things around my house. Anyhow. Yeah, there we go. And then it starts getting really cool. There's Marshall when he was little. Look at him. He's growing up. Now we got two of them. We're getting to go see him tomorrow. We're just glad that these kids love the Lord. And today they're raising our grandchildren. Heidi, this is, these are Juliana's boys. And Heidi's going to have a, a little child here in a few months. I think we can all agree uh, that it's worth the investment. So the second experience that showed me the worldview battle that was raging for the hearts and minds of our children was my first pastorate. As I mentioned, it was an inner city church in Hollywood, Florida, and we were blessed to see many people come to Christ and many children and teenagers were saved. Most of them were from lower income homes and could not afford Christian education. This is when I began to really understand the worldview battle that was raging in our schools. I said to my, eventually was able to hire a student ministries pastor, and he said, where do you want me? And I said, I want you where the kids are. We had about 150 children and teenagers by this time in our church. And I said, I want you where the kids are. And he said, well, they're all in the public schools here in Broward County, Florida. I said, well, go live in the public schools. That's where you ought to be. And he did. And he ended up being in charge. Our student ministries pastor had 32 Christian clubs. We had a Christian club in every middle and senior high school in Broward County, Florida. That was 32 schools. And so he started inviting me to come speak in those Christian clubs. And I would go wander the campuses and speak in the Christian clubs. And that's when I began to see, oh, my goodness. You got to remember, most of these 150 kids, their moms and dads had come from deep lives of sin. They hadn't been raised in Christian homes or a Christian church. And so these kids were getting saved. The teenagers were getting saved left and right. And these teenagers were coming to me and saying, don't you understand that everything you teach us here at church, they're actually teaching us the opposite at school, pastor. And some of their parents were 40, 45 years old. They'd been doing drugs or alcohol or whatever for decades. And, and so they were getting saved, but, you know, their life was half gone or more. But I had this passion. If I could get a hold of the hearts and the minds of this, this younger generation, I could, we could change the trajectory of their family forever. And as I was going in those schools and walking up and down the halls and seeing what was going on and hearing what the kids were telling me, it dawned on me, how can I win their hearts and minds when I've got them for two hours a week and that school has them for 40 hours a week? How can I do it? And that's where this began to, this burden began to grow in my heart that maybe Christian education was the best discipleship tool for a church that we could ever ever discover. I started dreaming about the possibility in that little church in Hollywood, Florida, of having these new Christian kids in a school all week. Sadly, it never became a reality for most of those kids in our church in Hollywood. I left after seven and a half years. Thank God many of them are serving the Lord today. But we lost far too many of them. We didn't have much time with them. In 2000, God called me to take a more rural church up in the state of Virginia. And much to my surprise, this church was an anti-Christian school church. I didn't ask that question. I'll never forget one of my first board meetings after moving there. I looked at him and said, what's the best Christian school to enroll my second grader in? And one of the guys on the board, who was also a county board of supervisors member, he looked at me and said, why would you waste your money on a Christian school? I was kind of shocked. 
He said, Jeff, you don't understand. Our public schools here are Christian schools. You know, I'm a county board of supervisors member. We've got all Christian administrators almost, all Christian teachers. I was a 32-year-old dad. I was wide open. I just moved out of the jungle. I'm thinking, hey, maybe he's dead right. I said, so let me find out where my daughter would go to school. And I'll go down to the public school and, and meet all the Christian administrators and the Christian teachers and see what they're teaching. And I did. Unfortunately for them, the vice principal who gave me the tour and told me what they'd be teaching was a full-blown New Ager. She had New Age symbols dangling from her ears. I said, wait a minute, I thought he told me all these people were Christians down here. She told me they were going to teach my child sex ed in the second grade. Again, I had one passion. My kids would come to know, love, and serve the Lord Jesus Christ. I was never going to let anybody into their life who would in any way work against that. And I was sitting, I was trying to be just as open because I'm thinking, he, he looked at me and said, this is not South Florida, Jeff. This is Virginia. Our schools here are way better. I said, okay, no problem. If they're way better and I can, you can, I can go down there and see what they're teaching, it's all good, then we'll be in good shape. I went down there and the more she talked, the more I figured out, man, there's no way. There's no way they're going to be teaching my kids that stuff. And so I walked out that day in the year 2000, looked at my wife and said, over my dead body, will anybody like that ever have access to my daughter's mind? Ever. And that's the day I made a commitment. Miraculously, within two years, by 2002, we launched a Christian school. I didn't have a goal of it. It just happened. God divinely orchestrated things. We opened a Christian school and watched it grow to almost 400 kids in the first seven years. And I saw the power of Christian education up close and personal as one student after another developed into a dynamic follower of Jesus. And what I dreamed of in Hollywood, Florida, I had now in Virginia. And today there are hundreds of those young men and women who are in business, medicine, law, government, ministry, you name it. And they're changing the world. World. The ones I like the most are the police officers in my area because they will never give me a ticket. You know what I'm saying? I bailed half of them out of stuff in school. And so, man, it's just great. They were cruising by going, hey, David, you remember high school? Don't even think about pulling me over. But anyhow, because of the call God has placed on my life, I now find myself speaking all over the country, evangelizing people to join the cause of Christian or more specifically biblical worldview education. I am constantly amazed to find wonderful Christians, especially church leaders, who still believe the myth that education is a worldview neutral enterprise. Education is not worldview neutral ever in any subject. There are no worldview neutral schools. Every school teacher and textbook is teaching either a biblical view of life or something other than that. Since every school is teaching kids what to believe, every school is teaching doctrine. All schools teach doctrine. Since every school tells kids the big story or meta narrative about life, they are sharing what they believe about God's place in this world. And when his name is never mentioned in 13 years of schooling, kids begin to assume he is irrelevant. One of the greatest curses of what has happened is this. People say to me, well, you know, we're not losing all these kids. We have more young people. You know, we, we hear the stories about kids who abandon the faith. And I've heard zillions of those stories. When I speak to grandparents across America, they come up weeping and tell me how many of their kids don't believe in God, don't believe in the Bible. All the, I hear this all the time. So we hear those stories. But let me tell you something that's even worse are all the young men and women who didn't leave the church, but who sat on these pews and because God was irrelevant to math, science, history, geology, and everything else, their entire education, they literally live with this sacred, secular divide. Again, church is sacred, while we're here is sacred, reading the Bible is sacred, singing worship hymns is, uh, is sacred, but when I go out to work on Monday, that has nothing to do with God. That is a curse on the church. And it's because their education Never had anything. They never connected the dots that God is sovereign over the entire universe. Every school teaches children about our origins, our history, our purpose for being here, what the rules are and who makes them, where we go when we die and who the heroes are. They're all teaching this. Okay. So every educational system is a religious system of some kind. The only question is what religion are they teaching? Did you know atheism basically checks the boxes for a religion. Atheism talks about origins. Atheism talks about purpose. Atheism tries to come up with some kind of a moral code for us to live by. It's a religious system. And it is the dominant system in our school systems today. Let me show you a few of the differences between the Christian religion that is taught here in your school and the secularized religion, secularized religion being taught in non-Christian schools across America. And I want to do this by highlighting how secularized education answers some of life's greatest questions. All worldviews are trying to simply answer the greatest questions of life. 
And I'm going to show you a little comparison here. Um, and really what I've done is I've just taken Genesis 1 through 3. I've really been fascinated lately with how many of the major questions of life the Bible answers in Genesis 1 through 3. I mean, it is a phenomenal study. Matter of fact, you'll see the first article in one of those magazines out there that I've written on this. Answers to life's ultimate questions from Genesis 1 through 3. And I'm going to write a series of articles in these magazines over the next uh, couple years. But let me just show you some of the differences. First of all, who has ultimate authority in this world? Did you know this is a critical question if we're going to have the rule of law even happen, you know, established in a society? We teach children that in the beginning, God, you know, all humans are accountable to God and will stand before him at the end of life. The first four words of the Bible, in the beginning, God. If God created it all, if he started it all, if he gave us a book and said, this is how you're supposed to live, then God is the ultimate authority. And guess what? Right now we live in chaos because we don't know who's in charge. Young people do not know. Who's in charge? It is a crisis of authority. What is the secularized world teaching? Man is autonomous. We rule our own universe. In reality, the strongest person is the one who has authority. Where did we come from? Obviously, in Genesis 1, 2, 1 and 2, God created and designed everything out of nothing. The secularized worldview teaches children out of nothing. Chemicals came together and we evolved over billions of years to where we are today. Who are we as humans? This is huge. The biblical world, you teach us kids that were created in God's likeness and image, were superior to all other species and more valuable than any other species, intellectually, morally, and socially, were far above all other species. This is what we're teaching children in a Christian worldview educational setting. And let me tell you something right now. You know why people cry over wells that are stranded on a beach more than they do over murdering babies in the womb? Is because they don't know what it means to be human. Young people don't know what it means to be human. You can't throw your life away. Every life is utterly valuable. A life in the womb, a child who has disabilities, uh, an elderly person at the end of life has immense value because the image of God has been stamped upon them. We don't mess with that. When you assault a human being, you literally are assaulting the image of God himself. Secularized worldview says we're simply the most highly evolved animals with no special rights or privileges, polluting and robbing the planet and other species of their rightful place. I don't know if you've seen any of those videos where they go on to college campuses and they ask these young people this. If you were at your home and you looked over in your neighbor's swimming pool and your neighbor was drowning and your favorite pet was drowning with him, you could only save one. Which one would you save? And probably 95% of the college kids today answer like this. I would save my pet. And they literally, whoever's doing the interview will say, why would you save your pet over a human being? They said, because I love my pet and I don't have any relationship with that man. You know what? They don't know what it means to be human. They do not value life. And I'm going to tell you something. The more, the farther we get away from a Judeo Christian understanding of life, the more we're going to have regimes raise, rise up here in the, in the in generations to come to absolutely destroy life like Hitler and others. All right, we've got to keep moving. What is our purpose in life? Our purpose is to be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth and subdue it, take dominion over all that God has created, serve as God's vice regents in this world. I mean, there's tremendous purpose for every human being in this world. We are God's vice regents. We're to take dominion and again, bend creation back towards God's design. That's our purpose. That's why we do all that we do and bring glory to God. Discover your identity and do whatever it takes to make yourself happy. I was on a flight from down to Louisiana, this 18 year old girl from Germany was sitting next to me. She spoke excellent English. She was going to, she had a track scholarship at Louisiana Lafayette University, I think it was. It was her first time ever in the United States. And she was nervous. And I just talked to her and I was, I was trying to make her feel better. Uh, actually, before the talk was over, I said, yeah, my grandfather was killed by the Nazis. <laughs> that, that probably wasn't the best thing to say, but I said it for this reason. I said, and I want you to know, I told you that so that I could tell you that you're not accountable for that. I don't hold you accountable. As Americans, we love you. I love you. I'm thrilled that you're in the United States of America. Welcome. And she just looked at me like that. But I asked her a question. I said, Can, I said what kind of school did you go to in Germany? She said, public schools, secularized schools. I think she told me she'd never darken the door of a church in her life. And I said, can I ask you one philosophical question? She said, what is it? I said, she said, I'm not very good at philosophy. I said, well, you can answer this one. I said, in all, she said she'd been in, in, in those schools for 14 years. I said, in those 14 years, what did they teach you was the purpose of life? And she looked at me and she said, um, she didn't know how to think very long. She goes, they taught me that the purpose of life was to do whatever I want to do. 
I said, would it be accurate if I said they taught you the purpose of life was for you to do whatever you want to do so that you could make yourself happy? She said, that is exactly what they taught me. And we can't figure out why we have a bunch of narcissists running around our world today taking selfie after selfie after selfie after selfie. And we have people chasing happiness but not pursuing truth. And we're miserable. All right, we got to hurry. How do we know our gender identity? In Genesis 127, male and female, he created them in every way two genders makes perfect sense in the real world. Secularized worldviews teaching kids your gender is determined by how you feel about yourself at any given moment. I gave a speech at a large camp in Michigan this year. Um, and I gave one on social justice in the afternoon. I couldn't believe it. This is a camp of 3,000 people and they have huge crowds at night. But in the afternoon seminars, you usually have 40 people. I announced I was going to give a speech on social justice. I had 250 people show up in the afternoon. And, and after I was done, these two high school girls came up to me. And we were talking about identity in this. I was talking some about identity in that speech. And they came up to me and she said, there is a girl at my school that thinks she's a dog. And she runs around the school all day barking like a dog. And because that is her identity, the school can do nothing about it. She, they literally let her act like a dog all day long at school. You see where this chaos leads to? There's no ending point, all right? How do we define the family? God perfectly designed men and women to come together in marriage and raise children. The arrangement works best in sustaining healthy children, families, and societies. The secularized worldview defines family like this. A family consists of the people you currently love, have feelings for. There is no set arrangement of people who form a family. It can be, it can be between opposite or same sex and even between multiple partners. We're a mess. What is wrong with this world? Man chose to rebel against our holy God and brought the curse of sin into the world. All are born with sin in their nature and are bent to do evil. That's what the Bible says. That's our problem. Did you know that? That's our problem. And, but what does a secularized worldview teach? In spite of the fact that our lives are predetermined by genetics, and they do believe that, humans are basically good but are corrupted by the evil that surrounds them. They also say the bad things people do in this world are inevitable because we are evolutionary creatures who cannot ultimately control our instincts. Listen, the farther we may move away from biblical truth, think about this. In the most secularized nations, you can murder somebody and get maybe eight years in prison. That's unbelievable. But you see, they don't really think people are ultimately responsible for what they do. We're evolutionary creatures, all right? How do we fix our broken world? Christ has come to redeem humans and our broken world. And when we follow him and his plan, broken things are redeemed and restored. Secularized worldview teaches continuous, we're continuously evolving and developing our scientific understanding of every field till we conquer all the natural things that bring sickness and evil into our world. How do we define morality? You know these things here. You know what the biblical worldview is on that. But secularized worldview, there's no absolute moral code. Man defines morality as he chooses and as it is useful for the survival of the species. How many of you have ever heard anybody in, in media or something recently say, that, that this is my truth? Now, that may not be your truth, but this, anybody heard anything like that ever? Okay, guess what? They're saying it all the time because they don't believe in absolute truth. But it's utterly contradictory. It's impossible to live in a world like that. So here's my point. Secularized education offers the wrong answers to all the major questions of life. Thus, students graduate with little understanding of who they are and what their purpose in life is. Even worse, they develop a sacred secular divide. That is, God is not involved in education, etc. He's only the God of my private faith world. Never be ashamed for one second that here at this church and obviously at this school that you're teaching children the Christian, tr Christian religion, it is an honor to teach kids the truth. I've discovered that if we do not teach kids the truth, someone else will teach them a lie and they will live with a convoluted and confusing view of life. I'm going to skip this video for sake of time. It would blow your mind, but we're going to skip it. Education is really a battle of ideas. Since I speak to so many non-believers in churches, I've been challenging their thinking. I like to ask the following questions. How much falsehood is too much for your child, for your children, for your grandchildren? How much falsehood is too much? Would you allow your child to attend a school that taught the following statements is true? Two plus two is seven. What if they taught turtles are faster than cheetahs? The Americans were defeated by the Nazis. George Washington was the king of England, or the law of gravity does not exist. I've been asking parents across America, would you allow your child to attend a school that taught any of those falsehoods? I've not had any parents yet who've agreed that they would. 
But what have they taught these falsehoods? God is irrelevant, even non-existent. The Bible cannot be trusted. God did not create the world. Sex outside of marriage is expected and same-sex marriage is good and normal. So I've been asking parents, two plus two equals seven is too much falsehood, but that is not enough. We've got to wake up, moms and dads, grandmas and grandpas. We've got to realize there's a war going on. And if we're going to win the hearts and minds of our children, we've got to be utterly involved. So is secularized education having an impact on what kids believe? I'm going to join the millennial statistics with the Gen Z's tonight. So these, this whole group, there's 139 million millennials and Gen Zers born from 81 to 2012. 139 million of 350 million Americans are now in these two generations, okay? They're currently from 10 to 41 years old, basically. As I said this morning, they're on target to be the most educated generation in American history. They're also on target to be the least religious. There's a direct correlation between the two. In 2000, 45% of Americans were considered practicing Christians. That is, they went to church, they did things, they read the Bible, whatever. 2000, 45% by 2020, we're down to 25% of Americans are practicing Christians. We've lost 20% in 20 years. Since 2000, atheists, agnostics, and knowns, those who have no affiliation with any kind of religion, at least verbally, have grown from 11% of the American population to 24% of the population. Secularized education has played a massive role in that right there, all right? 46% embrace, 48% uh, of this generation embraces socialism. I'm not here to be political, but I'm gonna tell you something. Marxism is a deadly ideology, it's deadly. It is behind critical race theory, critical equity theory in education, critical sexual theory. Marxism, hardcore Marxism is behind it. And we're going to have a revolution if we don't get control of this. That's what it leads to. All right. This is a mind blowing. This is a brand new study that George Barna just did. It blows my mind. 39 percent of 18 to 24 year olds in America right now identify as LGBTQ. Thirty nine percent. I mean, there is a shift. Now, let me tell you why there's a shift. In the last 10 years, our school systems have been driving this. I could tell you horror stories of parents who've called me. One 17-year-old boy walked into his Christian parents' home and said, I'm going to become a woman. They called me in hys hysterical. They literally said, he's never even acted like that. He's never even acted like he wanted to be. He's been dating girls. And somehow he's been convinced to become a woman. Literally because the parents wouldn't change and he threatened to kill himself. They took that boy out of those parents' homes. It happened in my hometown of Virginia just in the last three years. They put that boy in the home of two lesbians and let him go to school dressed up like a woman, changed his name while his other siblings were in the same school. So this is no joke. This is actually happening, this kind of stuff all over the country. 66% of this generation do not believe that God is the all-powerful, all-knowing, perfect, and just creator of the universe who still rules the universe today. A uh, vast majority embrace critical theory, ideological social justice, and cultural Marxism, and they embrace a thousand other unbiblical ideas and, world view, and, and pieces of worldview. So the bottom line is this. I don't mean to depress you tonight, but what we've been doing for the last 50 years has not worked. So what we've got to do in the future, we've got to do something different. Is there any hope? There is. The vast majority of millennials and Gen Zers who were given a biblical worldview believe the Bible are born again and are living out the implications of their biblical worldview in all spheres of society. Let, let me just give you guys something here. People have come to me in the past and said, look, you guys graduate kids from your Christian schools who are rebellious. So you failed. I said, yeah, we do graduate some kids from our Christian schools who are rebellious. But let me tell you why we did not fail. So there was this thing in the South when I moved here in, in, in 20, 30 years ago. Here, here's kind of how it went. A lot of kids grew up in the church. When they got to 18 years old, they went out and sowed their wild oats. This is what they called it. And first of all, I'm deaf on this idea that it's normal. But I ran into this in the church in Virginia. That's normal. They're going to get 18. They're going to go out and sow their wild oats. But because... In decades past, they had a biblical worldview, generally speaking. They believed in the Bible. They believed in heaven, hell, the judgment, all that stuff. They believed that Christ was the only hope for salvation. Because the church had won their minds, they had lost their hearts at 18. But they had their minds. When those kids got up to about 28, 30, they got married, they had little children. Guess what they did? They came right back to the church. 
And they said, we got to get our kids in church. We got to teach them about Jesus. And they would usually rededicate their lives to Christ and start serving the Lord. And that was kind of a pattern because they had their minds. But guess what has happened? They're not coming home anymore in great numbers. You want to know why? Not only did we lose their hearts, but we've lost their minds. And when a, when a young person doesn't believe the Bible, when they don't believe they're going to stand before God someday, when they don't believe there's a heaven or a hell or any absolute truth, they don't come back to the church because they think you're a bunch of weirdos. And so that's what happened. That is what has happened in our culture. We've got to get back. So here's what I say. Kids who graduate from a Christian school who might be rebellious, the good news is that we have got their minds. We've got their minds. And one of these days, they will come back to the faith. A vast majority of them will come back to the faith. So it's absolutely worth what we have been doing. I'm, just gonna, I'm not going to give you all the details about Renew Nation. I don't care. You've heard a lot about that. Let me wrap up with this story right here. This is Tatiana, a beautiful little girl that God put on my heart to give this inner city ministry in Roanoke five scholarships to Parkway Christian Academy. I did it sight unseen. I literally, it was the most reckless thing I about ever did. I, I said to this board, this inner city board, I said, I, I want to give you five full scholarships. The Lord just spoke to me and I want to give you five full scholarships. We're going to pay for everything. These kids were all coming from the projects of Roanoke. And I said, we'll pay for everything. I said, they can't have a felony and they need to be a little bit younger. That was my criteria. I called my head of school. She, she wasn't terribly happy with me. I called her and said, hey, you're going to get five scholarship kids from Acts 2 Ministries. I told them they couldn't have a felony and they, 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 you know, they needed to be a little younger. And literally, I never thought about it again until the day I decided to coach middle school girls basketball. And I was in the gymnasium trying out 20 some little girls. My youngest daughter, who was not all state, she was going to try out. And I thought if I coached, not that I'd ever be prejudiced, but I thought she had a little better chance of making the team if I coached that year. And so here they are, 20 some little girls running around the gym. Most of them look like my daughter struggling to walk and chew bubble gum at the same time. And then all of a sudden, this little girl bounced into the gym and started running circles around every girl in the gym. I was like, dear God in heaven, I have got a gift from above. And I said to somebody, who is that kid? And they said, that's Tatiana, and she's one of our Acts 2 scholarship students. Now, we didn't give athletic scholarships, but I have discovered that sometimes when you obey Jesus, he'll give you a scholarship. And, you know, I was coaching middle school basketball, and I don't know if you know anything about coaching middle school basketball, girls especially, but all you need is one great player, and you win the whole thing, you know? That's all you need. And I was like, I think we're going to win five games that year. And I'm looking down, I said, we're going to win every game this year. We're going to be dominant. This is glory to God. I pulled all them 20-some girls around me at the very close, and I gave them the coach talk. If you're going to be on my team, you're going to respect your teachers, you're going to do your schoolwork, you're going to respect your classmates, you're going to do this, you're going to show up on time. You're gonna, man, I gave them the coach talk. And I said, if you've got a problem with anything I said, hang around and talk to me afterwards. And the only kid that was left when everybody filed out of the gym was that little Tatiana standing there right in front of me. And she looked up in my face, and I, that, that's the moment, that's the day I knew God had a plan for this kid. It really, honestly, at the end of the day, basketball was the vehicle that allowed me to get to know her and keep her in that school. And I'll never forget, she looked at me and she said, Pastor Jeff, I got, I got a small problem in one classroom with one teacher. I said, all right, who is it? And I called back to the school and I said, I've met this little girl named Tatiana. I want to put her on my basketball team. She says she has a small problem in your class. And that teacher said, Pastor, she doesn't have a small problem in my class. She's got a massive problem in every class. I said, oh, no, there goes my basketball season. For whatever reason, the Lord would not let me go, let go of that girl. I was the only one in the whole organization she would listen to for the first year. One day it was so bad back there, I had nothing to do with discipline, anything in that school. I just had a whole team back there running the place. It was so bad and I wouldn't let them kick her out that they called my assistant on the phone and said, you tell Pastor Jeff, if he won't let us kick her out, then we're sending her to his office because we can't do a thing with this kid. They sent her up there that day. I'll never forget it. She was furious about everything. Teachers are disrespecting me. The students are disrespecting me. She was tackling kids, knocking kids down. She said, you know what? My mother taught me that if somebody touches me, I touch them back. I guess everybody in the school was touching her because she was touching everybody back. One of the coolest things that ever happened, I had a little seventh grade white boy in my church whose parents wouldn't discipline him well. Tatiana disciplined that boy one day. It was amazing. She scared him so bad that he ran and jumped a seventh grade boy in his female teacher's arms and wrapped her, his arms around the female teacher's neck and screamed, save me from Tatiana. <laughs> I walked away and said, the Lord works in mysterious ways, his wonders to perform. 
It took us two years to calm that little girl down and catch her up. She's brilliant. They gave up on her in public education. They told her in the last week of her sixth grade year, they brought her into the office. Said, Here's what she told me. She said, Pastor Jeff, they told me that I was so bad that they were going to send me to Noel C. Taylor likely the next year. Noel C. Taylor was the school they sent all the kids they lost complete control of. It was a dead end when she got there. But that day when she told me that, she was sitting in the back seat of my car driving down the road. And she piped up right after she told me about them sending her to Noel C. Taylor. And she goes, but then I got a scholarship to PCA. In the ninth grade, she first came in contact with Jesus personally at a retreat up on the, in the mountains of Virginia. It, wasn't, it, it was a powerful move of God that night, but it wasn't instantaneous. This girl had a lot of headwinds. Let me tell you something. She had a lot of headwinds. I didn't know. By the 10th grade, she led Parkway Christian Academy to the state championship. We, we lost by seven points, but she scored 58 points in the final four. That one little five foot six point guard. She was scoring on six foot two and six foot three girls. She was dominating. We just didn't have enough other players to, 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 to help us get to, the, get the final seven points or eight points. We sent her over to Liberty Christian in 11th grade because I knew she was going to play D1 ball. And she got that opportunity. She asked me to go meet with the coach and I met with him and he promised me he's going to take good care of her. A kid graduated with highest honors from Liberty Christian. And then she played four years for Liberty University. For all four years, Tatiana was a captain on the Liberty University. From her freshman year, she was a captain. That's the influence that young girl had. She was such a powerful Christian by this time. That's us a few months ago in Memphis, Tennessee. That kid graduated in four years with a bachelor's and a master's degree. She now has a second master's degree, and she has gone back to the inner city of Memphis, Tennessee. She'd been telling me for years, Pastor Jeff, I'm going back to, the, to rescue children like me. I'm going back to the worst of the worst in the inner cities. That's where I was at, and I'm going to go find me some kids, and I'm going to change their life like, you know, my life has been changed. And that kid is such an amazing, shining light for Jesus in the most dark place you can imagine. That's what Christian education is all about. If it wasn't for that school, there's no hope. There was no way that girl, we just, no church would have had her for enough time. We couldn't have reshaped her thinking. But God Almighty, he not only used our school, but he used a, another beautiful family in Lynchburg and others to really come alongside Tatiana. And today she's changing our world. Listen to me. I want to say this to the leaders of this church. Christian education can be thankless. I want to say this to the teachers in this, in this school and the administrators. Christian education is hard. It's difficult. You know why? Because it's the greatest work you could ever do. It's worldview shaping. You're changing the way kids think. You're changing destinies forever. You don't usually get to see it when they're in the fourth grade, the sixth grade, the eighth grade, even the twelfth grade. You don't see the fruit of your labor. But over the next five, 10, 15, 20, 30 years, you will get to see the impact that you have made on the lives of these students. So if you're going to truly give your children a biblical worldview in this church, as families, you're going to have to take, think very, very serious about education. And I highly encourage you in one form or another, give them a biblical worldview education in any way you possibly can. If you are here tonight and you can't afford that for some reason, I'm telling you, make sure that you're teaching your kids at home. God will help you. God will strengthen you. And I bet this church would help you if you really, really want your kids in this school. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for Bethel Church, and Bethel Christian School, Christian Academy. Lord, I, I just pray your blessings upon all of their endeavors for children, all the work they are doing, Lord Jesus. Would you, would you honor them? Would you bless them? Would you expand their influence? Would you anoint their teachers? Would you anoint their administrators? Would you anoint the pastors and Christian workers in the church? Would you anoint these parents, Lord, here and these grandparents here? Would you turn their focus to the children? Would you turn their hearts to the children, I pray? Would you, would you renew and strengthen this passion they have to, to rescue this generation of children? When they run out of energy, when they run out of strength, when they run out of resources, would you replenish them, I pray? Would you give them a greater vision than they've ever had in this area? What do you want this church to do on behalf of their children, on behalf of their families? What direction should they take? 
How many children do you want this school to influence, Lord? They have hundreds now, but what if you want them to have hundreds more? There are thousands of children and teenagers in this community, Lord, who are not developing a biblical worldview. And to think that we have a tool here, a vehicle here, which in many cases, non-Christian parents will bring us their children and pay us to teach them God's truth. Oh God, do your work in this place, I pray. May the coming years be the most fruitful years. May vision, new vision, burst forth in the hearts of these leaders, in the hearts of these parents. Those who have been apathetic, renew their vision, I pray. And do something that only you can do. And I pray that we'll hear in the years to come that out of Bethel Church and Christian Academy came a generation of new leaders who took the church, the school, their businesses, local government to new heights, who helped to realign the priorities of this community because they knew your truth and they understood how to apply it in all areas of our world. We praise you, Lord, for this wonderful place. Continue to bless them. In Jesus' name, amen.